James 5, verse 13, it says this, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. We'll do that tonight. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being. Even as we are, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful and we're thankful for this moment. Thank you for this day, this time and space that we can share together. Lord, we just pray these next few moments, Lord, that you will open up our eyes. Lord, allow us to hear what it is that you're speaking to us. Lord, open up our Open up our eyes, allow us to see what it is that you're speaking to us. Open up our ears and allow us to hear what you're saying to us, Lord. We thank you. We want to see what you're showing us and we want to hear what you're speaking to us. So, Lord, we ask that you remove distractions. Settle us in this moment. May it not be what's happening next. May it not be what's happening this week. But, Lord, let us be focused and attentive to what's happening now. God, we love you and we honor you. And it's your service. This is what we say. Speak, Lord, because we're listening. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. Listen, you may be seated. Family, I'm not a big fan of call centers. Now, no shade if you work at a call center. I'm not talking about the job. I'm just talking about my experience when I call a call center. Here's what I'm talking about. Recently, at our home, the internet went out. That's a problem. And it's not a problem because of a work-from-home situation. But it's a problem because if those kids, especially the youngest, cannot watch Bluey, have a situation on our hands. So you could understand the pressing situation that I was in. Sometimes I watch Bluey too. The dad is something else. That I was in when the internet was out. So I call, I'm not going to name the provider, so I call the provider and I walk them through what's going on. Like, hey, our internet is out, it's not storming, don't know why, and before you tell me all the steps, I've already done it, like I've, I've, I've reset it twice. Uh, in fact, I did it a third time. I pretended it was a, a Sega, blue, all that stuff. To, I, I did everything. It's still not working. So now I'm calling you help. Well, Mr. Hamilton, you've come to the right place. We'll get you taken care of. And we'll get your internet up in just a few moments. And I said, man, that's the kind of stuff I like to hear. But I'm not the person to help you. Let me transfer you to the next apartment. Okay, well, all right, cool. Give me to the next apartment then. So I get to the next apartment. And I go through the same spill. Like, hey, internet wasn't working. I need it to work. Uh, kids need to watch Bluey. This is important help. And he's like, okay, cool. Wow, yeah, that's a tough spot to be in. But no worries. This is, this is what we are here for. We are here to help. Only problem is, I've got to transfer you to the next apartment. Mm, Jesus, help me. That's like I want to fill it in a moment. So I transfer to the next apartment. Same thing. Hey, internet's not working. Tried everything. Still not working. Transfer it twice. Kids can't watch Bluey. Parent need help. Wow. I, I hate that this has happened. We really pride ourselves on making sure that you can access the internet and everything you need when you need it, because that's what you pay for. But I got to transfer you to the net. They transferred me back to the department that I started with in the beginning, guys. Can you feel my pain? Alex, help me out. I'm left at that point asking myself, 
I said, need help. Where do I go? <laughs> Who can help me? And I don't know. Have you ever felt like that when it comes to life? Where do I go? Have you ever asked that question? Who can I connect to? That I found myself at this place. I need answers. I, I need help. I'm trying to navigate life, and I've been doing it on my own, but it's not working. Hear me today, family. Can I tell you that there is a source that you can go to? There's a place where you can go, where you can receive the wisdom, the guidance, the insight, the direction, and everything else that you are looking for in life. And so today, I want to speak from this headline, who can I run to? Who can I run to? Come on, that was your opportunity to sing it with me. Who can I run to? Come on now. But to give a little context to the text, James, who is the half-brother of Jesus, he's writing to Christians who have been scattered. And in this chapter, he is reminding them, listen, we need to live as people who live connected lives. Like, yes, I understand you are facing hardships. Yes, I understand you're facing persecution. You've been scattered. But those are not reasons to live disconnected lives. But listen, he was also saying, listen, it's not just enough to live connected lives to God. Yes, of course, that's important. But oftentimes, family, we think it just stops there, but it's also important that we live connected lives to each other. So it's not just the vertical relationship that's important, our connection to God, but it's also our horizontal connection that's important, which is our relationship with others. And so as we answer this question, who can I run to, these collection of scriptures is going to give us a blueprint of what to follow as we navigate life. And so what I want to share with us today are just a few observations that will help us answer the question, who can I run to? And here's the first one. is this, go to God. Go to God. So look what James says here in verse 13 of chapter 5. He says this, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call on the elders of the church to pray over them, anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. So on the surface level, just kind of looking around this space, we, we could probably come to the conclusion that we are here today to connect to God. Now, maybe not all of us, but the majority of us, we're here today to say, hey, we, we showed up because we want to connect to God. But when we pull back some layers, I think we'll see that while we are here, most of us are here to connect with God. We want to connect with God for different reasons. So some of us, we want to connect to God because of what happened last night. We don't have to mention it. Just keep that between you and the Lord. Oh, don't get quiet on me now. <laughs> some of us, we want to connect to God because we told him, listen, if you would just, if you would get me out of this jam. One more time, you know what a one more time turns to one more time? I promise you, I'm going to be at church tomorrow. And so we, we showed up, we kept, we kept that promise. Others of us, we were like, listen, I was at Welcome Home Sunday, and it seemed to be some single ladies. So some of y'all showed up for Mrs. Wright. You know what? So what okay, why are we going to pretend? Come on now, why are we going to pretend on a Sunday morning? Others of us... Ladies, you're like, I was at Welcome Home Sunday too. And it was some single fellas. And they got the 401k, the TSP. And so you said, I'm going to come back for part two. <laughs> some of us, we just showed up because we're like, listen, I'm on cloud nine. Like, God has just been doing some amazing things in my life. And we couldn't wait. We had the clothes picked out. We were ready. Somebody messed with me earlier, said, man, Pastor Michael got his Easter fit on. Like, he was just excited. I said, yes, it's my Easter fit in August. Leave me alone. But we were excited to get in here. So here's what James is telling us. No matter if you feel like you're at the lowest moment of your life or you feel you're at the highest moment of your life, 
that you have to go to God. And so the, the answer to the question that escape asks, who can I run to? The answer is God. That no matter where you may be in life, family, no matter what your situation is, no matter how dark it is or how amazing it is, the answer is go to God. You can go to God in your pain just as well as you can go to God in your healing. You can go to God in the middle of your hurt just as well as you can go to God in a season of joy. You can go to God in the low moments just as well as you can go to God in the high moments. What James is, is communicating to us is that we go to God. It doesn't have to be the dark moment, but it could be the exciting moment. The answer is that we go to God. Don't go to the bottle. Don't go to the pills. Don't go to sex. Go to God. He is the answer. He's the solution. He is the source of life, everything that we've been looking for. He's the answer to every question we have. So James is saying, go to God. And when you go to God, understanding that we're not going to someone who can't handle what we're facing. Proverbs 18.10 says, listen, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. It don't say a weak tower. It don't say a so-so tower. It don't say something that can't get it done. It says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Scripture says just at the mention of his name that every knee will bow and every tongue can listen. It is a strong name, meaning this, the Lord can take care of whatever you're facing, that he can handle whatever you're going through, that the righteous run into this name and are safe. You know what I, what I picture it? I picture it like baseball, where you're trying to make it home, and here you are. That You see the, 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 the ball is coming your way, and you're running as fast as you can to get the home plate, and you slide in, and the umpire goes safe. That's what the name of the Lord is. Life has been chasing you. Pain has been chasing you. Hurt is going after you. But here you are running at the name of the Lord, and he is saying, safe. You are safe from horror. You are safe from despair. You are safe from shame. You are safe because the name of the Lord is strong. So we go to God. He's strong enough to handle what life may be throwing at us. But listen, going to God can't just be one of the options. It has to be the option. It can't just be something we consider. It can't just be something we might do. But it has to be the thing we do. It has to be the place we choose. So off the top, the first observation, James is showing us that we need to go to God. Here's the second observation. He says, go in faith. Look at verse 15. He says, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. So James right here is saying that the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. But this causes us to ask the question, what is faith? Because there could be a lot of different approaches when it comes to faith. It's like the person who says, hey, I've got a few health challenges. But I've got faith God's going to heal me. And so then the friend says, well, what are you going to do? Oh, man, i got faith. Okay, is that the trainer at the gym? Is it going to help you, like, get it together? No, I have faith. So that's what some of us think faith is. Well, we just, we just have faith. For some, it's, it's, is it name it and claim it? Is it blab it and grab it? Is it, well, I manifested, I spoke it into existence, that, that with my words, I created my world. What is faith? We've defined it before. Here's what faith is. Faith is the confidence that God will not lie. It's the conviction. It's the belief. It's the understanding. It's the knowing it's being unshakable that God will not lie. If he said it, it will happen. If he said it, it will take place. Faith doesn't say, I believe it because I see it. Faith says, I believe it because God said it. Faith doesn't operate on a timeline. Faith operates on what God has said. Because here's why faith doesn't work on our timeline. It's because for us, we operate in a linear way, meaning from this point to that point to that point. We're born here, and we die here, and we live life on this side of eternity in between. And so we operate from point to point to point to point, from place to place to place to place. But God doesn't operate in time 
with, within a linear perspective, but within a circular perspective, meaning he, he's the one who was, who is, and is to come. So he operates outside of time. So what may feel like it's too long for us is just on time for him. So that's why you don't have to give up because you believe for something but haven't seen it yet. God has not forgotten. He has not forsaken you. He has not given up on you. He's just allowing everything to come into place that needs to come into place. What we have to do is say, I am convinced. I am convicted. I am standing on this. I believe on this. Why? Because God said it and it will happen. And I don't know if I have anybody else in the room that believes that with me, that God is faithful to his word, that he will do what he said he will do. It's faith. It's the Greek word of faith here. It's pistis. Y'all like, what did he say? The Greek word, pistis, means this. It means persuasion. It means I'm persuaded that you can't move me off of this. Yeah, I heard what you said, but nah, this is what I believe. Yeah, I see. Okay, doctor, I hear you, but this is what I believe. Okay, family, I, I, I hear you, I see you, but this is what I believe. Okay, bro, I hear you and I see you, but this is what I believe. Okay, sis, that's what you said, but this is what I believe. I have been persuaded. And I, and I know that some of us in the room, we have been persuaded because there have been some moments in our life where it was dark. It looked like there was no way out. It looked like we weren't going to overcome this situation, but God stepped in at the right time. And where there looked like there was no way, he made a way. Where it looked like it wasn't going to work out, it worked out. Where our expectation was low, he not only met that expectation, but he exceeded that expectation. Where all the odds were were stacked up against us. He knocked down the odds and he put us in something that they said we would never have. Some of you, you prayed for a child. The doctor said it wouldn't happen. You found yourself pregnant. Some of you, you felt isolated and alone and you thought you would never find community, but you found community. Some of you, you said your credit was too jacked up and too messed up, but through trust in the Lord and his process, your finances got together and now you got the keys to the house that the enemy said you would never have. But it's not about you, but it's about the generation to come. What I'm saying is, have you been persuaded? Have you seen the Lord move in your life? Faith is this conviction that he said it and that settles it. I don't care what the odds say. I don't care what it looks like. I am persuaded. Come on, if God has done something in your life, can you give him some praise? But I don't care what the optics look like. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what the news says. I don't care what the headlines are telling us. I'm persuaded. Not because of me, not because of what I can do, not because of my intellect. Scripture tells us that who is God? He's not like man. He can't lie. So if he said it, it's going to happen. Can I tell you, many of us in the room, we are the result of prayers that were prayed decades ago meaning God was faithful to those prayers, and we are the result of it. You were walking and living the life that you were living because somebody along the way prayed in faith for you today. Pray for your marriage. Pray for your relationships. Pray for your finances. Pray for your life. He is faithful to watch over his word to see it perform what he said it was performed. So I don't know who, nears, who needs to hear this today, but somebody in here finds yourself in a moment of faith and it doesn't look like it's going to work out. The Lord says, you need to bag it on up, look at what I've done in the past, and know that if I did it in your life before, that I would do it in your life today. So don't you dare quit. Don't you dare give up. Don't you throw in the towel, but you keep on believing, but Lord, this one's big. This one's a little bit too much. I told you that the name of the Lord is a strong tower that when the righteous run into it, they are safe. So you better go back to the place where you know you are safe. You're not safe in fear. You're not safe in doubt, but you are safe in my name, the name above all names. So don't give up. Keep on. That's why scripture says, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. And just at the right time, you're going to step into what God says you're going to step into. It's persuasion. We've been persuaded. Now, some of you said, oh, that sounds good. You just got hyped, but where is Scripture? I heard you. 1 John chapter 5. This is the confidence 
we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Now, this doesn't mean blab it and grab it, name it and claim it. That's not what this is saying. The answer is we pray his will. If it is his will. Now, some of us say, okay, well, okay, how about this? I pray for that job, but I didn't get it. I pray for this outcome, and it didn't happen. I pray for this loved one to be healed, but they weren't healed. So I have a hard time reconciling when it says, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. I have a hard time with that. And can I tell you, family, I hear you, but the answer is still in the verse. It still means we pray the will of God. We ask, well, what is the will of God? Let's look at Luke 4, verse 18. This is Jesus talking. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. We see that. That he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So we are seeing the will of the Lord. Proclaim good news to the poor. Proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Recover your sight for the blind. Set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So we're seeing the Lord's will. Matthew 11. Let's keep going. Let's read this. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? Then Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Bless is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. So here's what's happening. John the Baptist, who was known as the forerunner of Jesus, so he was the one who came before Christ out in the wilderness yelling, prepare the way of the Lord. The Messiah is coming. So John was a, a forerunner out in the wild eating uh, wild honey and locusts saying, prepare the way of the Lord. They were first cousins as well. And so here it is. Jesus has shown up on the scene now. And so John finds himself in prison because John was he was relentless towards uh, the religious elite. And so he has found himself uh, locked up. And so he, he's at this moment where he's like, okay, what's going on? Because Jesus, the Messiah, you're here. But how come you haven't taken care of Rome? How come you haven't dealt with, with the, the Pharisees, the religious elite? And uh, just being quite honest, I would have expected you to come get me out of prison uh, by now. But I find myself still here. So here's what, Jesus, here's what John sends word back to Jesus, or he, or he reaches out to Jesus through his disciples, and here's what Jesus responds with by saying, well, what are you talking about, John? Is it not happening? Are the blind not receiving sight? Are the lame not walking? Are those who have leprosy, have they not been cleansed? Are the deaf not hearing? Are the dead not being raised? Is the good news not being proclaimed to the poor? Now, here's what Jesus says in verse 6. He says, Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. In other words, blessed is the one who is not offended by me being God and doing it how I please to do it. So this is right here uh, uh, makes a, a, a direct, uh, gives us insight to where we find ourselves in these moments where we pray for something in faith that sounds like it's according to his will, but yet did not see the outcome that we were believing for. Because we say, well, if his will is to heal, if by his stripes we were healed, how come they weren't healed? It's a fair question. Well, let's look at this, family. God is sovereign. We don't get to direct his sovereignty. And it means that he gets to rule and reign how he wants to. And oftentimes, family, it's in prayer where we discover that God's perspective was different from our perspective. That's why we are told that his ways are higher than our ways, that, that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So what am I saying here? I'm saying this, that God will answer the prayer of healing on either side of eternity that he chooses. And sometimes that is on this side of eternity, but other times, family, it's on the other side. But here's God's perspective, it's healing. Now, 
That doesn't sit well with us, and I totally understand that. You know why? Because we're on this side, and we want them healed on this side because we see them on this side. But God's perspective is, this is not your home, that you're only passing through. So if you would just hold on to me and let my grace be sufficient through your pain, through your hurt, through your disappointment, a time will come where you will walk the streets of gold and celebrate together in a new body. That's why I'm not so concerned I don't have these abs right now. But it's God's grace that allows us to accept his way of reigning. And there's just a different perspective that he's working from. But we have to be careful that we don't settle into this mindset that says, well, if God is sovereign, why even pray? If he's already figured it out, then why? We get into a tough spot at this juncture because now we're trying to figure out God. And Paul's like, yo, who, who's man to think that we can understand God? It's too complex. It's, too, it's, it's like, you know, you kind of watch those movies and it's showing like all these different scenarios. and Like we can't compute God. We can't figure him out. So we can't settle into this idea, well, then why ask if he's sovereign? Because we may fail to receive when we fail to ask. James 4.2 says, you do not have because you do not ask. So our responsibility is to still approach God full of faith that he will do what we're asking. But the faith is to trust his outcome and how he responds. Are you tracking with me this morning? So that's why Matthew 7 says, ask, seek, and knock. And the tone in which it is written is not, Ask once, seek once, knock once. The tone in which it is written is to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Because here's the thing about the Lord. You will pray about one thing and receive a revelation about a completely different thing that will not only impact you in the thing that you were praying for, but then God will open you up to a bigger perspective to see something that you didn't even see something. So here you are. You're like, Lord, I was asking you for this, but you showed me this. I was asking you for that, but you showed me that. That's why he says, keep on asking, seeking, and knocking, and revelation you will find. Let yourself be vulnerable. It's okay. I think it was Martha that when Lazarus died, she had this moment of vulnerability. Before Jesus raised him back to life, she had this moment of, of vulnerability where she's like, yes, cool, yeah, I know he will live again at the resurrection. And Jesus says, no, the resurrection is, is a person. It's, it's me. I am the resurrection. So because of Martha's vulnerability, here she was, was, was talking about one thing, but received a revelation about something else. That resurrection wasn't just an event, but resurrection was a person. And so I wonder, family, that if we continue in prayer, if we continue asking, seeking, and knocking full of faith, that God will say, listen, in those moments, I will be able to resurrect every dead situation in your life, every hopeless situation in your life, because you sought me. Are y'all tracking with me today? We go in faith, and we let God be God. And here's the final observation. Go to each other. Go to each other. When I was younger, my mom used to uh, play in the car a lot uh, this song. I don't even know if it's the title, but the words, the lyrics, as long as I got King Jesus, I don't need nobody else. Like, that's that's the English on it. Like, I don't need nobody else. Y'all ever heard that? I don't ever heard, I don't need nobody else. Yeah. I would sing it for you, but I'm resting my voice. I don't understand the laughter, though. But as long as I got King Jesus, I don't need nobody else. Now, that sounds really good. Like, you, it sounds like something you want to tell somebody at a moment. I don't need you because I got King Jesus. It sounds good. It just, it isn't good. We need people. We need others. While we need people, we need need the right people, but we need people. James 5.16 says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. 
So James, Pastor James says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. What is this showing us, family? It's showing us this. Healing happens in community. Healing does not happen in isolation. I just, I just need to get away. I just need to be alone. I just, I just need to get away. No, 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 no. Healing happens because isolation is not the same as silence and solitude. Silence and solitude is a practice that we can, can model out or, or activate ourselves in with the purpose of drawing closer to the Father. Isolation ultimately is protection from everything. So isolation is not silence and solitude. So we can't heal in isolation because you know what happens in isolation? Isolation, you will settle into believing all the negative thoughts that you are hearing in your head. And what happens, it begins to spiral out of control. And psychologists, psychiatrists will tell us this, that it is easy to repeat a negative thought. And negative thought build upon each other. So one negative thought produces this negative thought, which produces another negative thought. And we get in this downward spiral of nothing but negative thoughts. So every single thing that happens, we perceive with a, with a negative premise instead of something that is positive, healthy, and life-giving. All of that happens in isolation, but it doesn't happen in community because we set the stage and the opportunity for us to be encouraged in our moment of pain and uneasiness. So this is why healing does happen in community. But some of us was like, that sounds so good. It really does. But when you said confess to one another, you lost me. These folks be talking, <laughs> and I can't trust them. Well, listen, confess doesn't mean to everyone, but it means to someone. And confess doesn't mean in the way that the prophet Usher talked about. It doesn't have to be these are my confessions. It doesn't mean that you're sitting in the confessional and you're just spilling everything. But rather confess right here, it means to acknowledge openly and joyfully. So in other words, it's having maybe one or two people. It's a small group that you can go to and you can openly acknowledge your pain just as well as your joy. And it's not even about them having an answer or a solution for it, but it's about you getting that off of you and saying it. So someone can hear it, help you process it, believe with you, pray with you, and encourage you. So James says, listen, context. He says, context and community is what brings healing. I, I walked in this this week. First, I had a friend that called me. and He was like, hey, you got a minute? I was like, yeah, what's up? He's like, I got I to gotta tell you about this. This is just what I've been struggling with. And we just talking and talking. Well, he's talking and I'm listening and I'm responding where it seems to make sense for me to respond. And then he says, whew, man, thank you. I appreciate that. I needed that. And I didn't really say much. But he was like, man, I just needed to express that because I'm about to have coffee with these folks. And I don't want to go in here looking all mad and upset. And that helped. Being able to openly acknowledge hurt and joy. I didn't have a solution for him. And I'll be honest, I don't even remember what he said. But it was just the opportunity that he felt that that was a place that I could do that. And what he didn't know, he had to go. But I was like, hey, it was my turn. I got some stuff I need to say to you as well. But this is the kind of connection and opportunity that we need. Okay, now, if, if you're getting hung up on healing happens in community, if you're getting caught up on there, you're like, wait a minute, I don't understand that. Because isn't the Lord forgives and the Lord heals. So I don't understand when you say healing happens in community. Let's go to scripture. Look at 1 John 1, 9. Look at what it says. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive. But then look at James 5. It says, therefore, confess your sins to each other 
and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So look at these two verses together, and here's what we can come to. We can come to this conclusion, that we go to God for forgiveness, but to community for healing. So he is the one who forgives sins, but it's community where we are healed. And you can even see this. There's a story in Mark where these friends, they take they take uh, this, the, the, uh, their friend who's a paralytic, and they take him on this, this, this mat, if you will, uh, and, and they lift, they raise him up, and they do construction on a house because Jesus was in there preaching and teaching. It was crowded. You couldn't get in. So the only way for them to get in was to come through the roof. So they do construction on the house, and they lower this man down. It had to be quite embarrassing, but they lower him down because they were some friends. This is why you need these kind of friends, because there were some friends that says, nope, I'm not going to let you stay here. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you call me. I don't care what you treat me, how you treat me. I don't care. I love you too much. I care about you too much. I believe in you too much. God's hand is on your life. He has called you. He has purposed you. I'm not going to leave you right here. So they picked him up. They did construction on the house to get him in front of Jesus. He's a paralytic. He can't move. So you know what Jesus says to the man? He don't say, hey, you're, you're healed. He says, no, your sins are forgiven. He had to deal with those issues first. But then after that, he told him to pick up your mat and walk. Walk out with who? With the same people who carried him to that point. So God is the one who forgives sin, but it is healing. It is community that brings healing. So we go, are y'all tracking with me? So we go to God for forgiveness, but community for healing. Because we can't attempt to work things out with Jesus, but not invite anyone else into the process for healing. So it's not just, well, me and the Lord have worked this out. No, that, that is realized and processed in community. It's bringing others along in the journey of this is how you can pray with me. This is how you can stand with me in what God is doing in my life. What does that look like? It looks like having a tough day. And say, hey, look, we got to talk. We, we, look, I, I, I've got some things I need to get off my chest. I, I, listen, it's, it's, it's been rough. It's, it's been long. It's, it's having that place where you can go to someone, we need to talk. Because reality is, family, we can't get healed alone. And there's some studies that kind of illustrate this and extract this out in a large-scale way. There's this large-scale analysis conducted by a team of of researchers over a long period of time scaling to millions of people. So this is not just something that was done in a three-year span, but over 80 years this research has been conducted. And now they're not just in that, obviously, in that first generation, but they're into second generations as well of continuing this research. And Holt Lonstad uh, published it. And here are some of the findings. It says this, when you have close friendships, there is less loneliness and isolation in your life when you have close friendships. And, the, and understanding friends, our friendship is important because everyone that we call a friend is not actually a friend. We're just friendly with them. But it's also important for us to properly define and understand what a friend is. You say, how we do that? I have a question. Hey, so how, how cool are we? I'm not going to be offended. Tell me so I know how to deal with you. <laughs> we just don't do that, but you can so I can know if I can come to you for this and if you can come for me for this. And if everyone says, no, cool, this is how we keep it and it's all good, but I know. You say, man, that's kind of harsh. Well, no, it's actually stewardship. It's stewardship of your emotions. It's stewardship of your soul. It's stewardship of your well-being. So now you're not developing an expectation out of someone that you call a friend who's more an associate or someone that you work with. Are y'all tracking with me? So it's actually soul care. Here's some, some more results of the findings. Stress is reduced. You have emotional support. Uh, there's better professional development. You live with a sense of belonging, and you have support through challenges. She says also in the study that those who have uh, at least a few close friends in their life that they can share their troubles with, that these people are 60% happier than those who don't. So research is showing that living an isolated life is not enough, that we need other people. Here's more. Having a few close friends in health outcomes, such as 
high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer have better results than diet and exercise. So in other words, it's important for you to have a few close friends facing some of those challenges than what diet and exercise would do for you. <laughs> some folks in here said, listen, I heard enough I'm on my way to get that burger right after service, and we're going to do it together, so now we good. <laughs> But it's showing you the power of friendship. Here's one more. Not having friends was on par with smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So we're seeing the importance of friendship, the importance of relationship. And yes, this is where I enter a shameless plug. This is why you should join a belong group. Because you can be positioned to live a connected life. That yes, our vertical relationship with the Lord is important but so is our horizontal. So get in a group. Well, what if I joined one and it was terrible? Okay, try another group. What if that one was terrible too? Try a third one. What about that one? Look in the mirror first this time. <laughs> it had to be said. It had to be said. I'm joking. I'm joking. If you're offended, you can email to imoffended.org, you know. But look how, look how science has caught up to where scripture has been for thousands of years. Ecclesiastes, two are better than one because they have good return for their labor. Drop down to verse 12 of the same chapter. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. So scripture's been saying this for thousands of years. Proverbs 18, 24, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So all this time, the Lord has been telling us we need each other. So, yeah, we, we go to God, we go in faith, but we also go to others because a broken person becomes whole in community. You can't do it alone. You have to do it with others. And as we close today, I want to look at the last part of James 5, 16, where it says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. There's a lot of advances. AI can do a lot. I had some terms and conditions. I had an email that says, hey, uh, agree. We've revised our terms and conditions. And, you know, it'll tell you. It'll take like 55 minutes to read those. And I'm like, what are y'all just trying to bypass on me? So I copied and pasted the terms and conditions, and I put it in chat GPT, and I said, tell me what this means so that I can understand. And that thing broke it down in like four or five bullet points. So meaning, the world is going to continue, I just gave somebody a cheat code right there, but the world is going to continue to advance. There's going to be te technological advances. There's going to be things that we thought would only be on the Jetsons and actually become a reality. But hear me, family, no matter how advanced we get, and if I can get some keys because it'll, it'll help me land this plane and make me sound a little bit more spiritual. No matter how advanced we get, prayer will never be obsolete. No matter how much wisdom we attain, no matter what AI does, no matter what Tesla does, no matter what the next invention do, no matter where that rocket goes, no matter how anything happens, we will never move past the point of needing to be people of prayer. Prayer will never be obsolete. Everybody, I thought it was on smoke break, but I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. Here's why I prayer, I'm joking, guys, come on, you got to lighten up a little bit. Here's, what, here's how we can look at this. When I go at life on my own, I can only do the best that I can do. So when I go at it on my own, you're getting the best that I can do. Here's, here's as far as I can make it on my own. But when I pray, I get to see the best that God can do. Here's the point that I got it. Here's all I have. Here's as far as I can make it. But when I pray, but when I get on my knees, but when I humble myself, but when I repent, I get to see the best that God can do. 
So we can look at this and say, well, Elijah, yeah, he can pray and he, he can call down rain where it hasn't rained. What well, scripture is saying, you can do what Elijah did because Elijah was human just as I am. Elijah was human just as you are. So when Elijah is at this point where he did the best that he could do, Scripture tells us that he prayed, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain for three and a half years. But verse 18, and again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain. So can we get to a point where we say, and again I pray, and again I pray. I got a no on that one, but I kept praying. I got a no on that, but I kept praying. I got a no on that, but I kept praying. I didn't like the results in that doctor room, but I kept praying. I didn't like how my spouse and I talked to each other last night, but I kept praying. I don't like how my kids are acting and behaving, but I kept praying. I don't like how my career is going, but I kept praying. My, my change is a little strange, and my money is funny, but I kept praying. It it looks like it's not going to work out, but I kept praying. Do we have anybody who's committed to being a person of prayer? Because it's the prayers of the righteous that avail much. You say, well, who is righteous? Scripture tells us that the one who knew no sin, meaning Jesus, became sin so that you and I could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So who are the righteous? We are. Does that mean perfect? No. Righteous means we are in right standing with God because we have put our faith in Jesus. So now your prayers are powerful. Your prayers are effective. Your prayers avail much. He didn't say, I need the pastor to pray. I need the elders to pray. I need all these other folks to pray. No, you want to see change? You want to see happy? You pray. You want to see your child deliver? You pray. You want to see your marriage healed? You pray. You ain't got to wait for me or somebody else, but it's getting down on your knees and saying, Lord, here I am presenting myself as a vessel, asking you to do what only you can do. I've done the best that I can do. Now I'm praying to see the best that you can do. We got to be people committed to prayer. I want the Becoming Church to be part of the community that flips this city upside down for the kingdom of God, that it will be hard to go to hell in the city of Huntsville and Madison because there were some people committed to praying. People are crazy, pray for them. Can't stand your boss, pray for them. Problems with your sister, your brother, or bad relationship with your parents, pray for them. How it is isn't how it has to be. Prayer changes. Well, I pray and my situation didn't change. It may not have changed that, but it changed you. It gave you a different perspective to see God. Well, I ain't seeing it yet. Keep on praying. Prayer changes. It's prayer where these walls will fall. It's prayer that we can see God do the best that he can do. So whatever it is that you're facing, whatever it is that you're going through, don't you stop for praying. Don't you stop believing. You haven't seen it yet? Keep praying. It hasn't happened yet, keep praying. The food in your pantry, it has an expiration date. But the prayers you send up to heaven, they don't expire. So listen, Abraham didn't see everything that the Lord told him that he see. But you and I are a reality that it happened. Because if Abraham was here today, he couldn't count the descendants of him. So sometimes, so we got to understand prayers outlive us. So you can pray for your kids, 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 kids right now. You can pray for the generations behind you. And you can say, well, it wasn't good before me, but now through prayer, you got an opportunity to change what happens after you. Pray, family. We can fill up a room we say worship. It'll be empty if we say prayer. But prayer is the secret sauce. Prayer is what makes it happen. Prayer is what changes things. All of this was just something that the Lord showed me here. What has happened is because of prayer. And it wasn't just the prayer of me and Katie, but it was the prayer of men and women that said, Lord, if you're going to do anything in this city, would you use us? And can I tell you, we're not stopping. we just getting started. This is only the beginning. And I wonder, can we be like Joshua? Can we cross over and say, Lord, this is territory and land that you have given us. And I'm not just talking about what the Lord would do in a church, but I'm talking about what the Lord would do in your life. Because if he's blessing a church, he's blessing you because we are the church. But it begins with prayer. 
He told Joshua to consecrate yourself, meaning set yourself, set yourself apart to me. Prayer is an opportunity to live set apart, not perfect, not getting everything together. Some of you say, well, I don't know if I can pray because my life's too jacked up. Listen, <laughs> there's no prerequisite for you to come to. He just says, come, all who are burdened, all who are weary, find rest in him. Just come, that's it. All throughout scripture, you know what we see? We see the Lord using broken, jacked up, messed up people to accomplish his plan in the earth. You know what you see before you today? A jacked up, messed up, broken person. And the only thing I just said was I'll say yes, Lord, to what you've called me to do. It's the same thing in your life. So there's no let me clean myself up. Just come. That's all. So prayer, family, it's not circumstantial. But prayer is necessary. So we, we're closing this collection. That doesn't mean we're, we're going to stop praying. Because prayer, prayer is the way. And it is the secret sauce. Come on, can you pray with me today, Father?